I love this project because of the challenge associated with integrating everything on board at such a small scale. I enjoy that it is still almost science fiction. My name is Farrell Helbling. I am an electrical engineer at the Harvard Microrobotics Laboratory. And my goal is to create autonomous microrobots. When we think about bees, we think about insects that are able to fly around an environment on their own. They're able to execute very fast and rapid maneuvers. The ultimate goal of the RoboBee project is to have a swarm of these interacting in the environment, both with each other and, you know, maybe getting some data about the area that they're in. When you think about a lot of the conventional robots and vehicles, they're able to use standard actuation methods. So you're thinking about rotary motors, rotary motion. Building something at the centimeter scale, you need to come up with how are we going to actuate them? So we come up with these piezoelectric actuators that actually act like muscles. When you apply an electric field across them, they contract. That's how we get our flapping. We have polyester, that's what the wings are made out of. We individually pattern the various layers of material in a very high precision laser, and then individually layer rigid and flexible material with adhesives. We stack it, heat press and cure it, and then once that is done, we assemble everything under a microscope. The RoboBee has a wingspan of about three centimeters and it weighs about 90 milligrams. So that means that it takes about 30 of them to weigh a penny. So I think it was in 2007, 2008, that we were able to get the first takeoff of one of these vehicles. What we had was a very thin four wire tether in a bundle going directly to the bee. And that is what provided power to those two actuators. The tethered flight was an incredible achievement. That was the culmination of a decade's worth of research. But we wanted to cut the tether. When thinking about trying to create power autonomous flight, the first thing we wanted to tackle was, okay, how do I put power on board? You can't just buy a battery off the shelf. A lot of batteries are very, very heavy. And so batteries are, you know, out. The solar cells are actually really convenient at the scale. You get a lot of really decent area for the mass, but everything changes when you add mass on board. That has a number of problems. The first being, okay, I'm putting a power supply on board, so I need to be able to carry more weight. So to solve the problem, we did a lot of little tweaks to the actuators, which allowed us to generate much more force. But the problem is if we increase our force, we're going to increase our power. One way to prevent that from happening is to slow our wings down. And a good way of doing that is to go from two wings to four wings. So our entire vehicle is the weight of a paperclip. A little bit less. The first time I was able to get a bee to fly, it was terrifying. They're fairly easy to break. That's why the bee is hanging by like an invisible thread. It doesn't provide any type of stabilization to the bee, but we just want to make sure that it's not going to fall out of the sky and die. This must have been, you know, test number 50, and it had taken, you know, six months to get there. I wasn't expecting it to fly. When it finally took off, it took off with such velocity that it came incredibly close to me. Three, two, one, go. Oh, that went really close to me. I'm really sorry. I was so happy. It is the smallest man-made robot that has been able to fly untethered. 
And so in the future, when thinking about what are the applications for these, we don't want to just think about one vehicle, but how could a hundred of them work together in an environment? Whether you're thinking about a search and rescue mission or environmental monitoring. But the thing that I often get most excited about is the way it inspires children of all ages and people in the broader community um, to really be like, oh, this is what engineers and roboticists can do.